Arkansas is essentially the only state in the Confederacy to rejoin the United States during the war. Now, if you look at the readmission date, it's actually 1868, but, and you're gonna say, well, that's not during the Civil War, and you are correct. But it was enough of a state that the United States Congress accepted the Constitution, allowed the civilian government to take back over, and was, it was enough of a state to be able to send it the 13th Amendment to, for ratification, and they did so. They didn't seat their senators as the only reason that it's not really fully admitted until 1868. But from my pers perspective, I would definitely say that that is indeed being re readmitted. If you are sent a constitutional amendment for ratification, sounds like a state to me. <laughs> but he'll there, he'll be there, and he'll be there all the way up through April of 1864 when he is requested to go back. He's requested by General Sherman to go back and fight with him all the way down to Atlanta. So he will go all the way down to Atlanta with General Sherman. He will eventually take command of his division. Finally, about time he gets a division command. Well, and then here's the, uh, the part where William Bowles comes back into play. William Bowles has been a Democrat this entire rest of this time, and he's, he's gone through and he's lived his life, and he's eventually, much like the Sinn Féin and the Irish Republican Army, there's Sinn Féin as the political wing, and then the militant wing is the Irish Republican Army, well, the Knights of the Golden Circle, the Copperheads, is an organization that is pro-Confederate, but they are more interested in pro-Confederacy from a political standpoint, not from an actual military standpoint. They're not willing to do anything active to fight, the, fight for the Confederacy or fight the Union. Well, they have their own subdivision that is interested in that, and they're called the Order of the Sons of Liberty. And the Order of the Sons of Liberty, their first action, which they should have had, was in July of 63, when John Hunt Morgan goes into Indiana and Ohio and launches his great raid through there. However, they found the Union forces, the authorities, found out about it and were able to keep them from doing anything. However, we're now approaching the fall of 1864. What's coming up in the fall of 1864? It's a presidential election, right? Well, if you're going to end up with a militant organization whose idea is to fight for the Confederate States of America, what better time to disrupt anything than during a presidential election? This is a fantastic time to do this. Well, so Governor Morton of Indiana will request uh, from President Lincoln some prominent Indiana soldiers to come back and deal with the problem once and for all. While Nathan Kimball is chosen as the commander of that, he's a senior officer, one other officer who is chosen of that is actually Benjamin, Colonel Benjamin Harrison, who will later become President of the United States. So there's some fairly prominent individuals that happen to do this. Well, William Bowles, there are, he's number three in the organization. The, the top guy is a fellow by the name of Fisk. Well, Fisk is tried in absentia, he escapes to Canada, and is really never heard of again. So number two is a fellow by the name of Milligan, Lambden Milligan. Number three is William Bowles, who is now a major general in the Order of the Sons of Liberty. So Nathan Kimball is ordered to go back to Indiana to arrest his old colonel. I do appreciate the irony of that one. He gets back there, he does not personally arrest uh, uh, William, uh, William Bowles. He has a captain do, do that. And they are these five men, the five, there are a total of five men who are, who are arrested. And they are sentenced, they are tried by military tribunal, sentenced to be hanged. And that should be the end of it. Well, it's not. Moving forward a few years, this is in 1864, move forward two years, the, uh, the sentence is commuted from, from death by hanging to life in prison. It gets all the way to the Supreme Court, and the case is now known as Ex Parte Milligan. Now, from 1867, fast forward to the early 21st century, so just a few years ago, in fact, when everybody's talking about, well, we, we have the, um, you know, these detainees who have been arrested, and they're on there, in there without trial, and, well, guess what the case is that they had they brought out to release these individuals from prison? Ex Parte Milligan. So now Nathan Kimball is ringing through the centuries with his actions in 1864. 
He will rejoin the army, however, moving, changing topics again. He will rejoin the army in enough time for the Nashville campaign. He will, he will miss Spring Hill and Franklin and he will rejoin at, Na at Nashville where he is given command of, his, of a division. And this is a personal part of the story for me. He will actually take command of my great, great, great grandfather's regiment. So, which is fantastic. 115th Illinois Volunteer Infantry Regiment is the, the infant, is the regiment that my ancestor was in, my ancestors were in, uh, the, the, both the direct one and the lateral one. All right. And they fight at Nashville. So he is the commander of, this is, the, Steve was wondering why I'm interested in Nathan Kimball. I'm interested in forum for here, but I'm also interested in forum for that as well. So that kind of answers the question as to why I care. He will be promoted in, on February the 1st, 1865 for, for a, a brevet major general. So for gallant and meritorious service on the battlefield at, Na at Nashville, Tennessee. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with a brevet promotion, it is not a full promotion to major general. It just says that if you are acting outside of your, your normal capacity, you will take the pay and allowances and grade of whatever you, whatever you were promoted to. So in this case, it's a major general. But if you're acting as your normal capacity, so commander of division, you are the commander, therefore you are brigadier general. That's all it means. It's, a, it's an honorary title. Doesn't really give you anything. It's just nice. <laughs> He will be mustered out in, 18, or, um, sorry, in August of 1865, having done nothing else the rest of the war, unfortunately. For now, so now, into civilian life. He goes back to civilian life, and keep in mind, what did he, what did he find out as, part of the, as, as being the military governor of the state of Arkansas? He found that he is not just a, an able battlefield commander, but he is actually an able administrator. And he will, he will join a political, he will join the political entity, basically. He will run for uh, state treasurer and he will, be, uh, he will receive that in 1867. He'll be state treasurer of Indiana. He'll be the state representative of Indiana. He'll join the, the, the Freemasons in 1867. He's doing things, he's getting back into life. He, in fact, he will never officially ever again practice medicine. So he, he's, a, he's a doctor from the beginning part of his life up to the Civil War. After the American Civil War, he never again practices medicine full, full time. So state treasurer of Indiana, he's in the General Assembly in 1873. And in 1874, U.S. Grant will appoint him as the Territorial Surveyor for Utah Territory, making $750 a month, which is a heck of a lot of money at the time. I don't know what a doctor from Indiana ha knows about surveying, but judging from what I can tell from the records, he was actually a fairly good one. He was, <laughs> he was, he was interested, keep in mind, this guy's interested in helping people. So he lays out towns, he's interested in laying out um, mineral rights, but he's also interested, and this is rather strange for somebody from the mid 19th century, he also appears to be rather interested in the welfare of the native peoples in, in, in Utah. He knows where they're at. He knows what their, what their claims are. And you read this in his reports of what, the, what territory the Utes will claim and what territory the other, other places will claim. So it tries not to interfere with the, the natives, with, the, with the, the Native American population of Utah. He does his best. Well, you, territorial surveyor, he's replaced under Rutherford B. Hayes. Rutherford Hayes has a better position for him. He says, instead of being the territorial surveyor for Utah Territory, you're out there anyway. So, hey, would you rather be the postmaster in Ogden, Utah? And you can say, well, he goes from the territorial surveyor to being the postmaster, big deal. Well, Ogden is the biggest post office in the West between Lincoln, Nebraska and Sacramento, California because there are two railroads that run through, through Ogden. One is the Union Pacific, that's the first transcontinental railroad, that's 1869. And then the other one, I don't remember the name of it, so please forgive me for that one, but the other one is another transcontinental railroad, but it goes north and south. So it runs from Billings, Montana south. So it runs down that spine of the Rocky Mountains right straight through there. So in order to get anywhere in the west in terms of postal, postal service, you have to go through Ogden because it's the great meeting point in the West. He will in fact have, a, have an assistant who was also a Civil War general, followed by the name of Robert Minty, who was a cavalry commander at Chickamauga for the Army of the Cumberland. And he will 
in 18, 18, I'm sorry, 1890, forgive me, 1890, there it is. <coughs> Forgot the exact year, 18, 1899, Nathan Kibble will be, will be very ill. He'll be in bed for two months. In 1890, Robert Minty discovers that there was a theft at the post office. Nathan Kimball will be exonerated by the inspection, but it is strongly suspected that Robert Minty was the thief, though it is never enough, it is never sufficiently proven. Okay. About thirteen hundred dollars they get away with, by the way. He will be in, he will be active in politics after the war. He will be in, he will be one of the founding members of the Military Order of the Loyal Legion of the United States, one of the founding members of the, of the Grand Army of the Republic. He will be a founding member, in fact, he will be one of the first presidents